Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation presents Our Story, hosted by the Foundation's Chairman and President, Jason Vialba. Each week on Our Story, hear the personal and intimate stories of Hispanics all across Texas, told in their own voices. Our Story provides insight into a community of people who are literally and figuratively changing the complexion of the United States. This is who we are. Welcome back to the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation's Our Story, where we bring you the stories of Texas Latinos from all walks of life, from business to politics to retail to finance, wherever we find interesting stories, we reach out. Today will be our finale of the season. We're ending the season on a high note with someone who does not currently reside in Texas, but has many Texas ties and is truly shaping the way we in America perceive politics. And I think you're going to find his story compelling, but more importantly, I think you're going to find what he's working on fascinating. I know I do as a bit of a wonk. This is Mike Madrid. For those of you who do not know who Mike Madrid is, you might Google the name and Google the words Lincoln Project. That organization has been instrumental uh, in changing the complexion of what politics looks like in America today. And Mike is a founder and one of the visionaries for what the Lincoln Project was about. We're going to talk more about that later, but I'd just like to welcome Mike to our show. Mike, welcome. Jason, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to do this with you. What an honor it is for us to have somebody as high caliber as, as you are, your name, really did receive so much attention during this most recent presidential cycle and before. But I want to go back to the very beginning of time. I, With my guests, I like to hear their stories, where they come from, if they're immigrants, if they have an immigrant story, about their parents, grandparents, what shaped your life, those kinds of things. So let's start from the beginning. Are you Where are you from originally? So I'm from Southern California. I'm a Mexican-American. My grandparents from both sides have distinct journeys here. My maternal grandparents came from Sonora and Durango, or northern folks, desert people. And my grand, my paternal side is from the New Mexico Territory. Mexicanos, both sides, of different trajectories. My parents met in Los Angeles, which is where I was born, and I grew up in a place called Ventura County, which Californians will know is it's the northernmost county in Southern California. It just sits right up above LA County. And my folks moved there in the early 1970s when a little town called Moore Park, which was a town of about 3,000 people, I would say 80% Mexicanos, immigrants, longer term residents, very much an agricultural town. The name Moore Park is actually the name of an apricot, which were grown in the orchards there. And through the 80s boom, Ronald Reagan's president, former governor of California, kind of the heyday of Reagan conservatism, the town around me changed. It became more suburban. It became more bedroom community. It became wealthier and whiter. My life was really about navigating these two distinct worlds, right, That which many of us are so familiar with. It was my own Mexican-American identity in kind of an increasingly white world. In many ways, it was in reverse. California at the time was a lot of you know, white people seeing more Mexican-Americans migrate. But the ability to kind of navigate and succeed and feel comfortable or feel less uncomfortable is often a way I, I try to phrase it in both of those lives that I was living really became central to the work that I've spent my life doing, which is navigating politics and understanding and becoming an expert in Latino voting trends, but also working in Republican politics. A lot of people are like, boy, that's kind of a unicorn. How do you possibly do that? And the answer is that's just kind of the way I literally had to live my life every day growing up, you know, at, at home with the family and then heading out to school and, and operating in a different environment. So I want to talk a little bit about that because in Texas, our stories with Texas Latinos are often integrated into the community. Anywhere you go, it's a third, a third, a third, Anglo, Hispanic, African-American in major cities, and then usually Anglo, Hispanic, otherwise. 
it sounds like from what you're saying that in California, it may be different in the sense that it's one world or the other. It's not an integration, integrated community in the, the 70s and 80s when you're growing up. Is that accurate or is that right? That's a really great question. And it's actually one that I tackled when I went to the, the East Coast. I actually went to the East Coast to school. I did my undergraduate work at Georgetown. And I spent a year and a half on some thesis work that explored the different politicization of Mexican Americans in Texas, or as Hispanics, as you like to say, in Texas, and Latinos, as we like to say, in California. They're very distinct. And the main difference is that there is a longer history of the Hispanic experience in Texas, okay? San Antonio, as everybody knows, has been around longer than Jamestown. It's been around, it's been around hundreds of years. I mean, there are multi, multi-generational families of Hispanics in Texas, and that has brought both a more oppressive behavior in some ways, but also a closer integration, a lot more seamlessness in civic society. And that never really hit home to me until I started working with a firm in San Antonio. I worked with the brilliant Lionel Sosa and Frank Guerra, two of the best Latino political marketers out there, marketers generally, but but Latino experiences that they bring to the bear for their own solutions. That's a very distinct difference than the Californios, which existed in California. There were only 300,000 people in the entirety of California but for statehood. So the, the, the Mexican-American experience, the length of it is really much more firmly rooted in Texas with longer term generational institutions than you see in California. Our Latino community is much more migratory, much more recently arrived, much more transitionary. There's really very, very few people that have been in this country or families that have been in, in this state, rather, in California for longer than than two or three generations. That's very, very rare. It's not that uncommon in Texas, or I should say at least it's more common in Texas. Because of that difference, that distinction, as you and I may have chatted over online, you know, one of the reasons this organization was formed the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation was to explore some of these distinctions of Texas Latinos. And I think you keyed in on that in your comments. And and that's something that conventional wisdom around the country, particularly in the mainstream media, they just don't often discern differences between California and Texas and Florida. I think we saw that play out Mm -hmm. in the 2016 or the 2020 election cycle. And so now people are more cognizant of it, but I think you really key in on the reason. In California, because it is migratory often and and agriculturally centered, the Hispanic community, did you experience a level of anti-Latino sentiment that may not exist in other parts of, of the country where you've worked? I really did not. And that became a central part of my work in terms of politicization. And again, I've had the distinct honor of both working, being educated, and growing up and living in different parts of this country. I spent a year in Arizona. As I mentioned, I worked with a firm based out of San Antonio. I grew up and spent most of my formative years and then my professional career in California. But I also went to Washington, D.C. in the early mid-90s. And what I realized was the way America discusses race in the United States is overwhelmingly black and white because of our history. And the East Coast drives the media narrative. It just does. And there, there isn't a true history of clearly horrible discrimination, oppression, slavery with the black experience. And to try and reconcile what the what the brown experience has meant, largely Mexican-American, and let's put this in context, when we talk about the Latino community, the Hispanic community in America, 80% of us are Mexican-American. There's these Cuban variations, which are important. There are Central American differences, Puerto Ricans, for example, as well. But overwhelmingly, what we're talking about is Mexican-Americans, yet it's the least recognized and the least discussed I would argue primarily because of our geographic location, right? We're southwestern 
community overwhelmingly in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California. Obviously, we're expanding into other places, but our histories are there. That's not where the media narrative is. And, and as a result, you see a very strong overrepresentation with Puerto Ricans and Cubans in our media, in Hollywood, in other institutions. Uh, sorry about the long setup, but it's important to understand because like so many Tejanos or Mexicanos in, in California, most of us didn't realize we were that distinct or that different. I, for me, it was a little bit different because I grew up in a town of you know 80% Mexican-Americans when I was five, six, seven years old. By the time I graduated from high school, only 20% of us were Mexican-American. So I saw the town around me becoming more white. And every year that I was going through school, I was more and more aware of my Mexican identity at a time when it never occurred to me as a younger person. And you fast forward to, to the East Coast, and I was literally dating girls who had never met a Mexican before. <laughs> you know, I'm dating girls from Kentucky and dating girls from you know, the Midwest and Rust Belt states and, and have, meeting friends from, from Hawaii and people who had literally had never met people of Mexican descent before. And that really spurred and catalyzed my work and understanding the changing demographics that even as a young person, I recognized that what was happening in the Southwest by the latter part of my life was going to be happening all over the country. And I wanted to spend my life doing that. And Jason, one of the great blessings I have had is to have spent 30 years of my career studying, researching, analyzing what the emerging Latino vote and population and electorate and social changes were going to be and right as I'm hitting this point in my life and career, the next phase is kind of this inflection point. We'll be watching what happens as we become the largest plurality and then the dominant part of the society. And it's just, I feel very fortunate that my life's work and life trajectory will literally be spent half before and half after. It's almost like AD and BC, right? It's to be able to see what life was like before and life after in America. And it's what I spend so much of my time, effort and energy thinking about and working on. Well, your, your timing is impeccable with regard to that, because you speak with such understanding of the nuance of our community. And it's one of the failings, I think, of, of the mainstream media and really just conventional wisdom that they aren't able to tease out those distinctions like you just did in you know a three-minute discussion. You've said more about our community in three minutes than the New York Times could write in 4,000 words, right? right. And right. I think that's because, not because they're not qualified and capable, but just because so few people have had your two things that you have. One, you're highly educated. And two, you've spent significant parts of your life working and living across the country from both coasts and then through your work in, in politics. So so education, obviously, in your family was important. In Texas, a four-year university for a Hispanic is still relatively rare. And even in other parts of the country, it's still not as common. What drove that? How is that possible? That or What was the impetus to, to make sure that you went not only to a four-year university, but one as prestigious as Georgetown? That's a, a really good question, too. Look, I graduated from high school with a 2.1 GPA. I barely got out of high school. The motivation to go to college was really never imparted upon me with my parents. My father actually did graduate from college. He went to night school after he returned from Vietnam and was raising a family. But I never remember really a process of thinking about college or going to college. So right after high school, there were very few options for me. And so I started Literally, I was the manager of a Domino's pizza store, <laughs> and I, was, I guess that was going to be my career. And my, my best friend from high school, who's still a dear friend of mine, went to Arizona State University, and we were just talking. He's like, you might as well just come out here. I mean, I'm having a great time, and come hang out with me. I mean, you can do that what you're doing kind of anywhere. And so I did, and I realized pretty quickly, thank God, I'm very fortunate, that I got my act together pretty quick and realized, man, if you don't get, go get a degree – you're going to be doing pizza for a long time. And I had the, the great fortune, one of the, one of the great stories, and it's really a Latino story too, was going back to California and being able to go to a community college system. This is a little bit of a sidebar, but it's very important. And it became central to my thesis work at Georgetown. 
the university system, the higher educational system in California is like 90% public school. We do have Stanford, we do have USC, we do have a, a, a private universities, but 90% of it is UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC San Diego, Cal State Sonoma, Cal State Sacramento, Cal State LA. And then there's, you know, 125, 130 community colleges. And the commitment that we made in the 1960s as a state was to make sure that any Californian that wanted to get a college degree could get one, meaning our community college system is free. It's essentially free. It's the, the cost is nominal. And what that has done for the economic mobility and the advancement for Mexican Americans and the catalyzation of the Chicano movement and Latino politicization is really, really remarkable. It's one of the untold stories of Mexican American politicization. You go back to the East Coast, for example, which I did. I transferred, I got my act together, got, got it together, got great grades, worked really hard, got involved in politics, transferred to Georgetown University. And what I realized is on the East Coast, 90% of those schools are private universities that cost $60,000 a year. Well, you can't do that if you're poor. Right. And so what it created was a very different East Coast and West Coast mentality. And on the East Coast, you see a very stratified society. If you're black and your parents didn't go to college and you grow up in Maryland or Boston or anywhere in the Mid-Atlantic, certainly in the South, you weren't going to go to college. You just don't go, which, again, is, is the history of the his historically black college and university system. And I know I'm getting off topic here a little bit, but it is it is important to understand where we as Latinos, we as, we as Hispanics are at. The University of Texas system is very similar, right? The UT system has allowed for a greater politicization because people who have historically not have had the money or even the understanding of the value of a higher education have had more opportunities. And it's created a way for Latinos to really dramatically increase our educational opportunities within one or two generations, whereas so many other immigrant groups in the past never had those opportunities or never had similar opportunities. And I think it's directly correlate to a commitment that was made to educate anybody who wanted to get a college degree. Your development at Arizona is, you know, a classic Latino story. You're, you're finding your way, maybe you're a late bloomer, and figuring out that you're gifted in, in a lot of ways. And politics is your muse. Georgetown, obviously, is the place to go for that. Your thesis becomes one of the seminal writings on Latinos in Texas. You've addressed it briefly before, but the first question I have is, one, what was it about politics that was interesting? I know I was a bit politically minded, even at, at six, seven, eight years old, and maybe it's the same experience that you had. But, you know, what drove you to politics, uh, this particular niche in politics, which is critically important today in the mid 90s was less important. And then three, three part question, you leaned to the to the center and to the right, which is unique for Latino from California, who studies at Georgetown. That's not a not always the story that's told. So I'd love to hear uh, how that process came about. So I grew up in a family of Democrats, like so many Mexican-American families, the sons and daughters of immigrants. My parents, you know, we had the stereotypical reverence for John Kennedy right next to the crucifix in our home. We, we discussed politics every night. My father was very interested in the events of the day, very interested in history, as was I. My parents, as I try to describe them, they were not politically involved, but they were very politically aware. And they encouraged debate, often heated debates at the dining room table. And neither of my parents, again, were, were politically involved, but they were very politically aware. We watched the news. We discussed the issues of the day. We discussed history and what that meant. We also were very, I came from a very uh, strong Catholic family where the values that were imparted in me were literally to look in the mirror every day when you're, you know, as a little kid washing your face, brushing your teeth, is when you see yourself and your eyes make contact with your own eyes is to ask, what am I going to do today for the least among us? Very Catholic, you know, it's, it's what am I going to spend my life doing to improve the lives of those less fortunate? And that value really, along with everything else, drove me to be involved 
in public service. I'm not an elected official, would never do that. We could talk about that too, but I became very interested in it. Now to the crux of, I think, that part of your question, which is my father was more conservative than I was. He was also a very staunch Democrat. He was both more economically and culturally and socially conservative than I was. And I could never reconcile that. As we would discuss this, I would be like, well, this you sound a lot more like Ronald Reagan than Walter Mondale. But you're voting for Mondale and you're committed to it. And a lot of what he would revert back to was, well, we're, we're Hispanic, we're Mexican-Americans, we grew up poor working class, and this is the party that looks out for us. But everything he was teaching me and everything he was espousing, the policy positions he had, sure sounded a heck of a lot more like Ronald Reagan. And I knew, I think, from that point that I, I was not a Democrat. And I was compelled by the idea of conservatism as it was explained at that time. It's, of course, very, very different now, certainly completely different in the Trump era. But conservatism, what I learned at my dining room table was that if we could improve ourselves with the idea that making myself a better person could be used as a resource to help our community, then that was my obligation obligation being a very important word in Catholicism and in Mexican culture. That is, in all candor, that is where I think I do part ways with a lot of Republicans and conservatives who are just like, it's about the individual. Take care of yourself. Make yourself better. Teach a man to fish rather than give a man a fish, and then everybody will be okay. I believe very firmly. That, by the way, is a very Protestant way of thinking. It's very white Protestant. A very Catholic way of thinking is how do I help my community and my family, right? My value system is based on how I'm improving the lives of the people around me in a communal sense. I was stitching together two very different life experiences, the rugged individualism and self-reliance and anti-government rhetoric of republicanism in the 80s, which I found very compelling, but I found it compelling as a tool to help build up and raise up the least among us. It does not escape me how unique that, that is. That, that type of thinking is not common at the Republican National Convention. I get well, that. It never it's, has it's been. Not, it's not today in the Trump era. And if you've read Tim Alberta's book, the one that he wrote last year, it, it hasn't been that way for a decade. Yeah. But... When I grew up and when my politics were formed, watching Ronald Reagan, watching H.W. Bush, watching George W. Bush, remember compassionate conservatism. Well, Jack remember Kemp. Thousand, yeah, Jack Kemp, thousand points of light. Mm -hmm. You know, the classic conservatism is driven by the same themes that you talk about. And, you know, my conservatism was predicated on Reaganism, which is, you know, we believe strongly in, in God and country and family, but we also endeavor to help those who cannot help themselves and to provide a, a safety net. That's what, when I ran for office and, and became a member of the legislature in Texas, that was what I ran on. That's the kind of mm -hmm. Republican that I was. Mm -hmm. And then it seemed in the last decade or so, particularly with the emergence of uh, first, the Tea Party, and then Trumpism, that that completely changed. And now mm -hmm. the party is driven by basically white nationalism and populism. Mm -hmm. And people who still claim to be Republicans look at me as somebody who's like, oh, you're not even a Republican. You're not even a mm -hmm. rhino. You're basically a Democrat. It's like, no, right. I'm I'm not that. I'm I'm a classic Reagan Republican. But the party is so different today. I may be, again, speaking at a turn here, but I, I think that's where you might have determined that it was time for some sort of a difference with this president. Let's talk about that. The Lincoln Project was, again, something that you and your close friends founded. What drove that? What was the beginning of that? Well, look, first, let me say, I think you articulated that change very well. And when I'm asked about my opinions and people who follow me on social media and Twitter, for example, and I start espousing some of these conservative beliefs are kind of like, oh, my God, see, he's just this bad guy and always has been. It's like, I have not changed. My conservative beliefs and convictions of helping people through that mechanism has not never wavered. My party has changed. 
And because I've worked against these elements in my party, somehow people think, oh, well, he's you know finally figured it out and he's this enlightened progressive lefty. And it's like, no, I, I, I don't. Those policies don't work for the poor. These policies work. And this is kind of what I'm still advancing. So in the same way that Ronald Reagan, when he left the Democratic Party, famously said is, you know, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. The Republican Party has left essentially me. It has become a party driven by white nationalism. It is a populist party. It is a statist party. And properly understood, populism is a direct threat to conservatism. It's, they're not compatible. They're diametrically opposed. You, you cannot believe in a statist nationalism. You cannot believe in populism and be a conservative. It's like you can believe in one or the other. Yeah, they're anathema. Like, they're anathema. They're anathema. They're, yeah. they're, they're literally opposed to each other. And so it's not like Trumpism is a gradation of Reaganism. These are enemies. In the, yeah. in the battle of ideas, they do not – they cannot exist in the same home. And so as a conservative, I felt an obligation to fight for my beliefs. Now, you know, what I was surprised and shocked by was how malleable so many dozens, hundreds of people that I had worked with for decades quickly just went over to say, well, I wear a red jersey, so I'm going to you know, go with where the Republican is. And that, I think, was probably the biggest concern and what led to my involvement with the Lincoln Project was these people, they're Republicans. They're not conservatives. It's like being, I'm a huge Dodger fan, and I like the Dodgers, love the Dodgers, grew up a Dodger fan. If they traded away all of their players and brought in a whole new roster of players, I would still be a Dodger fan. Th that's okay in professional sports because it, it's not consequential. <laughs> but when it's about the governance of the United States of America and the ideas that we believe in as a society, it's extraordinarily consequential. And so I'm very much a conservative way before I'm a Republican. What I realized is 99% of people, 95% of people anyway, were much more Republicans than they were true conservatives. Most people didn't have an understanding of that. That was surprising to me when I started seeing that, uh, the mm -hmm. Jerseyism, as you would call it, when people say, and my parents are great examples. My parents taught me what it means to be a conservative in the in the 70s and 80s with Reagan and Bush, and yet they you know, are very strong supporters of Donald Trump. And they look at me like I, I must be crazy because I'm not supporting the good guys. And I think you're exactly right. People are on teams. And and of course, I, I don't agree with everything that the other side believes in. But there are a handful of things that I do. There are times when, when I'm watching what's happening with the current president and juxtaposing it with the former president and seeing I agree more with what Biden's saying than what Trump was saying, particularly around things like tariffs and taxes and meddling in foreign affairs where embracing tyrants, those kinds of things. I just, I just never understood that. And that's what makes you a true conservative, because this may mind be mind-blowing to some people, but Joe Biden is much closer to being a classical conservative than Donald Trump is. Right. I, it's just quantifiable. You, you, you can point, argue that you know Trump changed the definition of conservative. I think that's a real misunderstanding of what an ideologically based party is. Donald Trump violated the basic tenet of virtually every aspect of conservatism as we have known it in the post-World War II era in the first year. He raised taxes on high income earners. He opposed free trade. He exploded our national debt. He subsidized markets. He wrecked the international framework that allowed for the advancement of the American experiment by undermining NATO and slapping the face of our allies. And I can go on and on, but there, yeah, there's, there's, there's the list, literally... The yeah, the list doesn't stop. And you know, no. you could point all those things are classic conservative things that he just went absolutely in the opposite direction. You know, you point to Reagan's comment, I didn't leave the party, the party left me. I say, I didn't leave the party, the party kicked me out. I lost in yeah. a primary to somebody to my right. And it was a function of being uh, one of the earliest voices in opposition to, at the time, candidate Trump. And, you know, I was absolutely excoriated for that. It was summarily unelected. And the party at the time, even in those early days of Trumpism, if you didn't embrace, you know, the dear leader, you were gone. And I think we've seen 
that play out over the last four years. And it's continuing the hangover that we're seeing from people like Senator Cruz and Senator Hawley and, and others is absolutely fascinating to me that, that those people embrace that anti-conservative strain of, mm-hmm. of Trumpism. Yeah. And, and look, let's talk a little bit about why that is, because it is important for listeners to, to really understand that. Look, when you and I were growing up and involved in Republican politics, the one thing you could not look, you could be pro-choice, you could be pro-life, you could be for gun restrictions, you could be for the Second Amendment. The one thing you could not be for was higher taxes. Like You just couldn't. And, and the reason why is that, that was the ideological underpinning that held the coalitions together, because once you increased taxes, you seeded the argument that more government was the solution. The virtue of conservatism was saying less government is the way to solve our problems. Let's rely on the human spirit. Let's rely on our human ingenuity. Let's rely on the private sector first. It doesn't mean being against government under under any circumstance. But what it means is let's begin first with the premise that we should try to solve our problems through a private sector solution. I think that's that's a very, very valid place to come from. It's one I still subscribe to. That is no longer part of Republican belief. You never, never heard once, not one time, did you ever hear Donald Trump give a speech, either impromptu or scripted, about the virtues of smaller government, okay? Because he doesn't believe in it. He's a, he's a statist. He's more than willing to grow government if it serves his constituency. And that is not conservatism, okay? It's the, it's the opposite of conservatism. And so the number one characteristic of the party today is fealty to Donald Trump. That's and that's cool. why you start to see this extremism, is it doesn't matter. You, you can support the Russians or hate the Russians or wherever you're at, but as long as you demonstrate your commitment to Donald Trump, that is all that matters. And it's why you see kooky people like Matt Gates doing everything they can to be more and more Donald Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's like, I'll put up more posters of him behind me and I will change my positions on whatever it is that he says. And the, the man can make no mistakes because I have to continually publicly demonstrate my fealty, the fact that I will bend the knee to the dear leader no matter what. Do you think that's, that's driven not- by primary politics? I mean, these individuals that do this, and it's horrifying to me to watch. I try to think, why would they do that? And the only thing I can come up with is because they believe that the 5% Republicans that actually vote in Republican Party primaries are going to be in the same position. And so therefore, if they don't show that fealty, they will not win and not have a chance to, to be you know, up against the Democrat. Is that what drives, or do they really believe this stuff? I think they, they increasingly really believe it. I think that began that way. I, I definitely believe it began that way because you have to remember the Cruises and the Hollies, there was nobody that was a Trumper before Trump. The seeds were there. The rising nationalism was there. You saw it. You went to conventions. You were in elected office. You remember those people, the you know the anti-Mexican people and the Sharia law people and the deep anger. Not even not even knowing what you're angry about, but you just got to be angry at something, right? I, I need to blame something, and blame is central to Trumpism. You have to have somebody to blame. It could be the Chinese where the Wuhan flu. It could be the Mexicans bringing their drug dealers and rapists and taking our jobs. It can be the Muslims imposing Sharia law. It, it's always th- – there's blame for something. If you watch Fox News, that's literally all it is. It's anger and blame grievance. for what is wrong. It's grievance politics. It's, it's white identity grievance politics. So when you take that to the next logical step – what you begin to, to see is what is essentially, it's a tribe, it's a gang, to the point where we don't even have a national party platform anymore because we didn't need one because Donald Trump had a convention and whatever Donald Trump said is basically what we believe. And for our listeners it, out there, that's literally the case. There is no longer a Republican Party platform because we don't need one. It's what Donald Trump says and everything else goes away. And I, when, I remember when that happened, I was I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it. Well, what it means is it's not a political party anymore because a political party 
these fights about party platforms and whether we're pro-life and how much we're pro-life and what commas. I mean, it's very mundane. It's very archaic. It's very boring for people who are not political nerds, but it's extremely important because it literally defines what the philosophy of the party is and why I am a Republican or why I'm a Democrat or why I'm a member of the party. Once you throw away the definition, it's like getting rid of the Bible, but saying I'm a Christian. What does it mean? It literally doesn't mean anything because there's no articulation of what it means other than Donald Trump tells us what's to believe. And millions of Americans are of that mindset where it's like, as long as he tells us what's to believe, then we'll believe it. One of the most frightening things to me was seeing how quickly the Republican base moved from being anti-Russia to suddenly thinking the Russians were our best and greatest allies because Donald Trump said so. And yes. that type of flexibility, moral flexibility, intellectual flexibility, ideological flexibility, showed me that this party that I had spent my entire life working and building really wasn't much of a party at all. It really wasn't based off of ideas or policy advancements. It simply became a vehicle for the raw exercise of power. So and this, that's where we find ourselves today. It's why the Republican Party doesn't talk about economic principles anymore. If you watch Fox News, which I don't, but if you do, 90% of it is discussions about Dr. Seuss books, cancel culture, Mr. Potato Head, Black Lives Matter, Antifa. Yeah, reasons, to be about, reasons to be upset. So that I, I want to be cognizant it's reasons of to time. Be upset, but It's reasons to be upset, but the reasons to be upset about, about culture – about the cultural issues, because foundational to all of this is a loss of American identity. And the Republican Party is a grievance party based off of American cultural identity. And what motivates the base are those issues. Is that where we, I mean, that's clearly where we are today. Is that where we are going to stay? And what's next? Because the Republican Party that you and I talked about earlier no longer exists and is unlikely to ever return in that form again. So what does that mean for a two-party system? Or does that mean that it's the beginning of the end of the two-party system? And what's going to happen to the Republic or what we what we used to know as the Republican Party? I don't even label it Republican any longer. It's the Trump Party. Yeah, the, I mean, there's a lot of questions there. And this is what I spend a very big part of my time now writing and speaking about. And I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about, about that briefly. But, but the short answer is I don't know, because this is this is unprecedented area. But let me explain some of the dynamics that, that are happening. The first is the Republican Party is never going to come back to the party that we knew it as a conservative party. It will continue to devolve into a white grievance white nationalist party, as long as that demographic continues to shrink. One of the books I'm working on is actually called Two Decades of Fire, because we are just beginning a 20-year period right now, demographically, where the white share of the population is shrinking to a point where it still maintains most of the political and financial control and authority over the country, but in 20 years, it probably will not. And that fear is what is driving the backlash. It's what drives the political extremism. It drives conspiracy theory. In many cases, as we're witnessing, it's driving insurrection and violent response because the belief is that if America is not a white Christian nation, that it's not America anymore. And I'd rather lose, I'd rather burn down these institutions and go down as a martyr than work to hand over these beautiful gifts we've been given over 15 generations as a birthright as Americans to the next generation of non-white Americans. There's this kind of Alamo to, to use in, in Texas parlance, right? Let's just go down fighting and we'll be heroes and we'll lose, but we'll be martyrs. There's a martyr complex. And that has really consumed the American right. Now, there is a growing space for people like you and I, classical conservatives, who are like, wait, we've got a philosophy of government that is not nationalist. We're certainly not Democrats because I don't think big government is the answer. And it's not going to be within the two-party system. I actually think we're headed more towards four parties before we're going to head towards three parties. 
And the reason is because I don't believe that there's an American center anymore. Even moderates like Joe Biden, even though I agree with Joe Biden more than I agree with Donald Trump, certainly, doesn't mean that we necessarily belong in the same party. It just means that I'm more anti-Trump than I am anti-Democrat at this point in time. And the rising tensions that are inevitably going to emanate between the Bernie Sanders wing of the party and the Joe Biden wing of the party are very close to manifesting. Like by summertime, these divisions will be on full and complete display. And so the Biden wing, the Bernie Sanders wing is actually growing. It's in an ascendant phase. I think there will be sort of the, a Biden left, a Romney right, a Trump right, and a Bernie Sanders left. I don't necessarily believe that the Biden wing and the Romney wing will come together because there's just far too many policy differences, including a philosophical difference. But I do also believe that we are characterized more by what we are against than what we are for, which is very important to understand because it explains the very narrow division between Republicans and Democrats. It also explains why we are in the most hyper-partisan era in the last 150 years since at least the Civil War, at the same time we're seeing more and more people leaving and disassociating with both political parties. This has been fascinating, and I want to be cognizant of your time. I know how busy you are. You probably have another call already lined up. But I want to thank you today for your insight. This is a great capper for our season. I'm hopeful that there are books coming uh, with your name on them, particularly around the four-party system. I think you're right. And that was the first, per you're the first that I've ever heard articulate it in that way. And it sounds right to me. And so I'm curious, is there a book on the way? What's next? I'm actually doing a lot of internet. I'm doing a lot of international work and international campaigns right now, because I believe that America's democracy, we don't realize how close we got to losing it or some of us do, but too many of us do not. But the threats to democracy that is happening is not just a purely American phenomenon. It's happening all over the world, and it's happening because of technological and demographic change. So the rising nationalism we're seeing in the United States is actually happening all over the world, and it's, it's a direct threat to democracies. And my concern is that as we lose democracies in other parts of the world, we lose allies in democracy in the United States. I want to start working and continue my work on democratic movements throughout the world. That will be my first push. Uh, I am working on a couple of books, a couple of concepts. I don't have as much time in the day as I would like to spend some of my mental energy on. It's just a matter of kind of, I think, prioritizing. But if there is a book that is forthcoming, you'll be the first to know and maybe could come on the podcast and talk about it. Well, that'd be great. Thank you again, Mike. Uh, your work is something that I continue to study. And I know my listeners appreciate your insight. I just think this was a fantastic and fascinating discussion of sort of where we are and where we're going. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week. And we look forward to running into you again at some future date. Thanks for having me, Jason. You got it. The Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation would like to thank you for joining us today on Our Story. You can find more information about the foundation at www.txhpf.org, on Facebook, on the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation page, or on Twitter, at TexHPF. Please join us next week on Our Story, a podcast dedicated to the voices of Texas Hispanics.